Cool. Hi. Okay, we are ready to make our very first Toxic Libs particle and spring example. Um, this is actually the example. It's the one that we are going to make, or it's already made, so we're just going to look at it and talk through it. Um, but we can see this looks very much like many examples we've had before in the past. We have this swinging object connected to another object. How is that working? I can also click the mouse here and I can pull this object around. I want to let go. It, it's a little bit elastic and bounces back and forth. This is a very simple system. It's got two particles in it and one spring connecting it and the world has gravity. So if we can understand how to make this, everything else we make in Toxic Libs is just an extension of this. It's more particles, it's more spring configurations and whatever imaginative, creative, exciting way that you can kind of put all this stuff together. Okay, so how do we make something like this? Okay, so there's a few things that we need to know about. Number one is, let's just think for a moment, it's a little weird to me actually that we did BoxyD before Toxic Libs, but that's what happened. Although I suppose these videos should be independent of themselves and not require you to have watched Box2D. So uh, I'm talking to myself, I realize, but uh, all of this is just me talking to myself, really. Um, so uh, let's think about this for a second. What are the elements of a Toxic Libs Verlet physics world? So if you didn't watch the Box2D videos, it's OK. But I'm going to make this make sense a little bit. In Box2D, there's something called a world. Then there's a body. And then there are bodies have shapes and fixtures. And then there's this thing called a joint. So toxic libs, a joint. So a body is the thing moving around the world. The world is the world that the bodies move around. And a joint is the thing that connects two bodies. Toxic libs, the way that we think about toxic libs, is going to operate in exactly the same way. The world is going to be called verlet physics. So we're going to make a Verlet physics object. It's a Verlet physics world. And in our case, in our examples, we're actually going to make a Verlet physics 2D object. So you can do it in 3D or 2D. But for my examples, for simplicity, we're sticking within 2D, although it would be nice to have a 3D one and a 3D video. And I add that to the list of everything we will always and forever wish we had and make eventually. OK, a body is a particle. So a particle is the thing that's going to move around the Verlet physics world. We're going to make a world. We're going to put particles in it and watch those particles move about. Particles, by the way, can have those behaviors. They can be attractive or repulsive, which is something very exciting that we're going to see a few examples from now. A joint in Toxic Libs we're going to think of as a spring. So a spring is a thing that connects two particles. One of the great things about Toxic Libs is it has a different kinds of springs. It has a plain old verlet spring. It has a verlet minimum constrained spring, which I'm obviously giving it the, the not exactly the correct name right now. But you'll see there's various constraints we can put on the spring to make sure that it can't like stretch beyond a certain distance or shrink beyond a certain distance, which can allow us to really control the stability of a system if we need to. So these are the things we need to be feel comfortable with. We're going to make a verlet physics object. We're going to make a particle object. We're going to make two particle objects. You know, if we look back at this example, we're going to make a world, Verlet physics. We're going to make two particle objects and one spring object. There's one missing piece, though, to this list that I haven't mentioned, right? Remember we had p vector, the good old days back when we had p vector, and we'd say p vector location equals a new p vector, and we were so happy. And then we had box ID, and we had vec2. Vec2, right? We were a little bit uncomfortable, but we kind of got used to it, and we we felt glad. Now we have Vec2D and Vec3D. So yet again, another set of vector objects, vector classes to work with in, in Toxic Libs. But we should be rejoicing again, because one of the nice things about the vector classes in Toxic Libs is that they are more advanced than the vector classes in processing. There are many more functions. They're a bit more sophisticated to use, and thus perhaps not as, um, not as easy to use. But there's a lot of power there, especially when the vectors are separated out. You know, whether you're using a 2D vector or a 3D vector, perhaps it's not as simple to like kind of, I don't know why. I think I'm like trying to justify why p vector in my mind is the way, made the way that it is. But, um, I think these are wonderful um, vector classes that uh, we're going to use with Toxic Libs. I, I mean, I love vector classes. We can't, ha can't have enough of them. Somebody make one called G vector, S vector, I don't know, whatever. OK, so this is the picture. This is what we've got. Now, we have another thing to discuss. <laughs> this, is, this is the really exciting part. We haven't even gotten to five minutes yet, so I feel like we're totally on pace here.
Now that we know the elements of the world, how do we actually make these elements in the world? Okay, so back again, if you remember back to the, the olden days, we wrote something called class mover. And in the mover itself, we had three p vectors location, velocity, acceleration. We wrote that update method ourselves, which had Euler integration. Blah, blah, blah. I'm sort of half writing here, right? This is what we did all on our own. This was our mover class. We were very proud of it. We're still going to use it. You're going to use it. We're going to love it and take care of it. Um, this is what we made. Then we got to this place where we said, ha, oh, <laughs> camera went off. <laughs> Hello again. We got to this place. I hope it recorded through that. We got to this place where we, we arrived at Box2D and we said, you know what? Box2D is going to handle the physics for us. We don't have to keep track of location, velocity, acceleration, and have an update method. What we're just going to do is we're going to make a, uh, let's just still call it a mover, I guess. I guess, well, I, I like calling these particles. So let's call it a particle. I should have called the first one a particle. And we kind of, we made this particle and we put a body in it. So a, our object was essentially a wrapper for a box 2D object. And we could say, like, we could always just add forces to it, or we could initialize it and then ask where it is so we could draw it. We had this reference to a box 2D body that was in the box 2D world that we could just sort of deal with all the time. Now, as if these weren't two great options on their own, the greatest option of them all is what we're going to do with toxic libs. If you go back and review those particle system videos, one of the things we spent some time learning about was inheritance. Oh, we have this base particle class that has all the sort of physics of particles, and we can just extend it to make star and rainbow and sparkly particles. And now, we're going to do the same thing with toxic libs, only we're not going to write that particle class. Not at all. We are going to just inherit toxic libs particle class. We're going to say class particle ah, extends Verlet particle. So the name of the actual object in toxic libs, and in our case it's going to be Verlet particle 2D, is Verlet particle. So we're going to say we, in an, in, we don't need to write the physics. All we need to do is write our display method. And our display method might draw a circle at the xy where that particle is. This is a really fantastic way of working. We're getting all of the methods. Our particle is a Verlet particle. It has, it has the ability to have attraction and repulsion forces. It has the ability to be part of a spring. It has the ability, it, it, it knows how to update itself for the, in the physics world. When the physics world gets updated, everything is controlled by toxic libs, but we can just write our own, we can interject our own design here. Or we could add variables, we could add a color variable to it if we wanted to keep track of its color or other variables to it if we wanted to. And we can, um, uh, we can apply forces to it. We can do all sorts of things to it. So these are really the three methods we've now covered in this course, or set of videos, or book, or whatever you want to call it. It's writing everything from scratch on our own. It's using a physics engine where we just bring in a variable to reference an entity in that physics engine. Or what I like at best here is this idea of extending a, an object that lives in a physics world. So the object, what we, we inherit all the physics, and we put our own design on it. Now, there's something kind of funny going on here that I would like to point out, which I think is even more exciting than just this, what we've done here, just alone. So one of the things that's super interesting about this is, OK, so where is the object? Here we have this p vector location. So shouldn't maybe particle Verlet particle have a vec 2D, right? If vec 2D is the object in toxic libs, it should have a vec 2D position, not a, uh, um, right? And we should be saying ellipse at position.x, position.y. But instead, we have x and y. So Verlet particle, we must have inherited just an x and a y. How do we do that? It turns out that Verlet particle itself extends vec 2D, right? A vector is a, can be a location on the screen. A particle can be a location on the screen with all this added functionality. And then our particle is our own design on top of that. So not only does our particle extend Verlet particle 2D, it has all of the vector functions built into it right there. So this is a really tremendous way of working, and I think a very smart way of designing a physics engine. And in many sense, we might have wanted to do that with our mover. Class mover extends p vector. But 
you know, I think that would have been a very difficult way to just start right from the beginning. Like, it was much simpler to kind of start to learn by putting p vectors in our code rather than have our mover be a p vector also suddenly additionally with velocity and acceleration. But that is something to, that is very important to realize when working with toxic libs. Your particle not only inherits from Verlet particle 2D, it also inherits from vect, vect2, vect2D. Okay. So now that we've kind of gotten that out of the way, let's take a look at where this appears in the actual code example. And I have a feeling I might have to fix this camera. Yes. OK. Uh, seeing like, I don't know, um, you say it's your birthday. I don't know. what uh, that, That's the song I thought of. Oh my god. OK. So let's take a look at this example. First, let's point out the beauty of this. Look at the beauty of this. Experience it, right? This is our particle class. It extends Verlet particle duty. It has no code and it has no location, velocity, acceleration, no update, no physics, no this, no that. All it has is our display function. So if you are the kind of person who wants your physics taken care of for you, but you want to really control the intricacies of how you're drawing stuff on the screen, this is a fantastic way to work. Um, you can really just work on adding a display method to the particle which extends Verlet particle 2D. So now if we look into the main program, we can see a few things here. One is, here's our world, Verlet Physics 2D Physics. That's the world we need to set up. We have two particle objects. Those are our particle objects, but they extend Verlet Particle 2D. And a couple things I should point out. This is a little bit of an odd line of code, which will make sense a bit more to us later when we look at behaviors. But the world has a gravity behavior in it, meaning, um, you know, gravity doesn't just exist out of nowhere, but one of the things we can add to our Verlet physics world is a, a, a kind of global force that points in a given direction. In this case, we have that force point down so that it looks like, you know, kind of 2D gravity on the screen. Um, we can also set the boundaries of a world, which makes objects not able to go beyond those boundaries. You can pick or choose whether you want that. And then here we are making two particles, one at one location and one at the other. And if uh, if I take out the gravity, by the way, and run it, you will see, look, I made two particles, one here and one there. One at width divided by 2, comma 20. One at width divided by 2 plus 160, comma 20. So there we go. Now, a spring. Oh, I thought we were like, we kind of covered everything here. But let's, let's take a moment to talk about what a spring is. So a spring in toxic libs is a very simple thing to make. And the way that we make a spring is by saying new verlet spring, and in this case it's going to be 2D, and we have to put four things here. We have to put four things here. So what is a spring? One thing we need is particle number one. Another thing we need is particle number two. So a spring has to connect two particle objects. So we pass in those references. As the, first two rep, as the first two arguments to creating a spring. So we make a spring, we say spring between particle one and a spring between particle two. The third argument is the rest length. So what is the net rest length? What is the length of that spring that it would come to rest at? So if we pull it apart, it springs back. If we push it in, it springs back. So that, of course, is a float. Just a number in pixels, in pixels. We don't have to do any crazy conversion here. And that's the third argument. And the fourth argument is the strength of the spring. And you can think of that as a number between 0 and 1. <laughs> I really should have thought of this before I began this video. But I'm pretty sure if you make that number 1, it's going to be completely rigid. So you, you, ba you basically can't. Uh, it doesn't have any elasticity to it. And if you make it zero, it's going to be kind of like, almost like gum that you could imagine that you're like pulling and it just kind of keeps pulling forever and ever and doesn't really have the strength to power, to, to kind of spring back. So, you know, you can kind of only do so much to describe these variables the best way, as we've seen, is just try a lot of different values and see how your system behaves. But generally, the strength um, is a number between zero and one. And someday when I realize that's not correct, I'll, I will fix this video. OK, so these are the arguments that we need to create the spring. And now if we go back and look at this, we can see that's exactly what's happening here. We make a new Verlet spring 2D. We have two particles, 160 and 0 0.01. So we have kind of not such a strong spring. So let's, let's actually just try messing with that value a little bit. We can see um, here I can kind of pull it, and it's kind of springy. But if I make this value 1, 
and I grab it, like I can't right now, it's not even letting me pull it. So one makes it a completely perfect rigid body. And uh, if I make it 0.9, uh, I have to catch it. It's very, I, I, I can't really pull it either. So you can see if I made it, uh, if I made it zero, uh, yeah, it just completely falls. It has no springiness to pull it back. So you can see there's a range there. I was right. I was right. So, um, so that's, how the, that's how the strength of the spring works in uh, toxic libs. Um, one thing that I should, there's two other things I should point out about this particular example. Number one is whenever you make these things, you need to make sure you add them to the physics world. So you can make particle objects, you can make spring objects. If you don't tell toxic libs they're part of the physics world, they won't respond to the physics. So you can see here we're adding each particle to the physics world and we're adding each spring to the physics world as we create them. Another thing that's important to realize is that there's a lock function. So you can lock a particle in place so that it can never ever move. And that's what's happening here with particle number one. Particle number one is locked. If I were to comment out this line of code and run it again, they just fall because they, they're, it's not locked in place and they're both responding to gravity. I can still pick this one up and move it around and you can see, um, but, but you can see here that they're not, neither are locked. You can lock and unlock things on the fly. That is a very important thing to realize. It's not, in this example, we're just setting it up as either locked or not locked. And the last thing I think that's important to mention about this particular example is that you know, you've got to make sure you have this update method in draw. So this is the equivalent of box 2D's step function we're only going to update the physics of all of the particles and all of the springs if we call update. And traditionally, we're going to call update once through draw. There might be some strange scenarios where you do it in a different way, but this is kind of the typical way of doing it. OK, so this is kind of all the bits and pieces of toxic libs. I, what I would say to you, actually, if you're looking for an exercise, is try to just come up with a scenario where you put, I don't know, put all the particles around in a circle and connect them with springs, or put them in a line and connect them with springs, or put them on a grid and connect them with springs, or make 100 random particles with 100 random spring connections. Come up with some arbitrary set of rules that you've designed for yourself to initialize a physics world, and then see what happens with that physics world. In the next two videos, we're going to look at a few examples of that. We're going to look at a string, a, a string of uh, particles connected with springs, a grid, this idea of a force-directed graph. We'll kind of talk through some of these examples, as well as look at how we can add attraction and repulsion behaviors to these examples as well. OK, um, thank you for listening. And I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs>